Китая у нас. even have the vaguest recollection of sunlight that has broken through in dreams. Remarkably impenetrable, almost, almost mythical. I wonder, did the gods smite anyone with fog? I believe Zeus blew some Jason's way. A new formula? A serum which, when ingested, diminishes all signs of life, from breathing to heartbeat to such a degree as to resemble death. But why would you want someone to think you were dead when you weren't? The Milton Smith case. Ah, of course. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Miglin. What's that? Uh, thank you for the tea. She's in mourning. Yes. Her husband died. Thirty years ago. <laughs> well, the Irish are a sentimental people. <sighs> Anything of interest in the paper, Watson? I do believe you have eyes in the back of your head. I have at least a well-polished silver-plated coffee pot in front of me. <laughs> There have been numerous petty thefts. Ah, the London criminal. Certainly a dull fellow. It is fortunate for this community that I am not a criminal. It is indeed. Suppose that I were Brooks, or Woodhouse, or any of the fifty men who have good reason for taking my life. How can I survive against my own pursuit? A summons, a bogus appointment, and all will be over. It is well that they don't have fog in the Latin countries. The countries of assassination. Ah, my mind is like a racing engine, tearing itself apart because it is not connected up to the work for which it was built. Life is commonplace. The papers are sterile. Audacity and romance seem to have passed from the criminal world. So, Watson, we do not propose to invest in South African securities. Well, how on earth do you know that? Confess yourself utterly taken aback. I am. I also make you, you sign a paper to that effect. Why? Because in two minutes you will say how absurdly simple. I am sure I shall say nothing of the kind. You see, my dear Watson, it is not difficult to construct a series of inferences, each dependent upon its predecessor, and each simple in itself. If after doing so, one simply knocks out all the central inferences and leaves one's audience with a starting point and an inclusion, one may produce a starting effect. <coughs> now, it was not difficult, upon inspection of the groove between your left forefinger and thumb, to feel sure that you did not propose to invest your small capital in the gold fields. I see no connection. Ah, well. Here are the missing links of a very simple chain. One, you had chalk between your finger and thumb when you returned from the club last night. Two, you put chalk there when you played billiards. 
Three, you never played billiards except with Thurston. Four, you told me four weeks ago that Thurston had an option in some South African property which would expire in a month and which he desired you to share with him. Five, your checkbook is locked in my drawer and you have not asked for the key. Six, therefore, you do not propose to invest your money in this matter. <laughs> How absurdly simple. Would that my eyes be as good as yours? Ah, but they are, Watson. You see, but you do not observe. Uh, for example, you have frequently seen the stairs which lead up from the hall to this room? Frequently. How often? Oh, I don't know, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? Many? No, oh, I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed, but yet you have seen. Oh. That is just my point. Now I know that there are 17 steps because I have both seen and observed. So you have. Have you set a date for your nuptials? Hmm? Oh, no, not yet. No misgivings, I hope. No. I am supremely contented and eternally in front.
Just wondering, Holmes, how is it that you and Mr. Wilde are acquainted with one another? Well, I've never known you to have a penchant for the theatre. I don't, but I do have a taste for logic, which is essential to the construction of a satisfying stage play. Some time ago, Mr. Wilde wrote to me regarding a minor literary necessity. While he possesses in abundance the skills of his craft, Mr. Wilde, like most brilliant men, has an Achilles heel. Titles. Titles? Titles. That small thread which pulls together all the others. I have on occasion uh, suggested a title or two to Mr. Wilde. Are you working on a play now, Mr. Wilde? Yes, sir, with Mrs. Bantry, as a matter of fact. But I'm afraid I won't be needing your services for this one, Mr. Mr. Holmes. Glad to hear it. Uh, what's the latest call? The importance of being forthright. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Ah, well, nothing. It's a wonderful play. His best yet, I think. A few mesmerizing scenes for your perusal. Will you be appearing in it, Mrs. Langtree? Oh, do say you will be. Oh, please, say it be true. Oh. There is a perfect part for her, Gwendolyn, but she insists she's too old. I am too old. Gwendolyn should be in her twenties. Not 40. 40 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remained 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> is that from the new third act? Yes, do you like it? Very much. <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Holmes? Could I play a woman in her 20s? You could play anyone. Anything at any time. Hmm. May I tell you the truth, Mrs. Langtree? I wish you would. You are too old. Holmes! <laughs> I think I'm going to like you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> uh, didn't I hear that you once had a girl at Hamlet? In my school days. Could you be persuaded to return to the stage? I have a character called Algernon Moncrief. You may stop there. I'm afraid it would be impossible for me to give my undivided attention to anything named uh, Algernon Moncrief. Now then, let me ask you a question. What was the purpose of this full gander? Hmm? Shall I begin? Please. Mrs. Langtree is being blackmailed. Oh dear. Unaware of the scope of your successes, Mr. Holmes, she refused to seek your assistance, saying that um, no one could handle the case. I appeal to her ego, suggesting that if you could see through a disguise worn by our country's most famous actress, then perhaps you could see through this mystery and identify the criminal. You saw right through my scullery maid. It wasn't difficult. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not nearly as accomplished an actress as Mr. Wilde thinks. Liar. <laughs> she was uh, assaulted in her dressing room at the Lyceum Theatre on Saturday evening during the closing night performance of the play Danger. A case of letters of a highly personal nature <coughs> written by Mrs. Langtree and uh, a certain gentleman, was stolen. Are you all right, Mrs. Langtree? Uh, did the brute hurt you? I have recovered. Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> did no one hear you scream? It was covered by applause from the audience when the hero of the play made a surprise entrance and stabs the man. I was able to pay my prop gun at the assailant, but even that did not deter him. Was your prop gun an authentic firearm? Yes. Altered, of course, so that it can never discharge. What were the letters doing in your dressing room? I had taken them there for safekeeping. A message had been sent to me hours before, just as I was to leave for the theatre. This person said, that they knew the letters were in my home, and that a burden was intended for that very night. They were bluffing, of course. They had no idea where or if the letters had existed. All they needed to do was watch the house. 
And when you left to the theatre with a bulgy purse, they would have known they had guessed correctly. I had been burgled just weeks before. And nothing was taken? Nothing of any value. They couldn't find this correspondence on their own, so they decided to let you hold them. And then, another note. Saying? That unless she handed over 10,000 pounds, the compromising letters would be made public. 10,000 pounds? Well, outrageous. May I see that note, Mrs. Langtree? Oh, I'm sorry. I burned it. I don't know why. I panicked and threw it into the fire. It was tough as well. Could you raise the sum demanded? Well, of course she could. The woman is worth Oscar, I'm addressing Mrs. Langtree. Yes, I could raise it. I take it that these are uh, intimate letters? Pile. From a youthful indiscretion, no doubt. Exactly. Mm. I'm afraid you must think me a bad person. Nonsense. It is absurd to divide people into good and bad. People are either charming or tedious. <laughs> you are <laughs> charming. I do not know that women are always rewarded for being charming. I think they are usually punished for it. Is that mine? <laughs> <laughs> How is the blackmailer to prove authenticity? The handwriting. Say it is a forgery. My private note paper and the gentleman's. Stolen. The seal. Imitated. The photograph. Bought. We are both in the photograph. That is very bad. <laughs> there you have it. The pure and simple truth of the matter. <clears throat> the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight shows us that the truth is always simple. It is man's thinking that is mother. Yes, but what I said sounds so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Lantry, yes. it would hardly be said that I'm a man who pays attention to the idle gossip of the day, but it seems to me a few years ago there was an inescapable story making the rounds. The insidious aspect of gossip is that so much of it is true. <laughs> I believe the gentleman in question is the future King Edward the Seventh. Oh, good God, the Prince of Wales? A Bertie to his friends, mm. of which he has none. <laughs> Oscar. <Yes. laughs> and so you see why I must reclaim this correspondence. I do indeed. Mrs. Langtree, why didn't you see fit to trust those letters with your lawyer or bank? I should imagine that given the power of the other party involved, it would be difficult to tell what indirect or political influence might be brought to bear upon a businessman. Exactly. Mr. Holmes, will you help us? You can solve anything. You've never been beaten. Ah, yes I have. Four times by men and once by a woman. <laughs> but what is that compared with the number of your successes? If I am to take up your plight, I must understand every detail. Uh, take time to consider. The smallest points may be the most essential. Well, that, of course, is understood. Mrs. Langtree. Yes? Yeah. How is the ransom to be collected? He's calling for it this evening. Tonight, at your home, and do not change your plans. There will be a knock on the door. <coughs> Give the ransom to the man who appears. Do this, or else publication will follow, and an innocent heart will be broken. Who is the innocent heart? I'm assuming it's Edward's wife, Princess Alexandra. Perhaps the blackmail was referring to you. Your sweetness. Was Princess Alexandra aware of the affair? I really couldn't say. This was some time ago. I repeat, from a youthful indiscretion. <laughs> what are the plans that you are requested not to change? We're reading a new scene tonight. Is this common knowledge? 
Oscar and I meet regularly, a fact which is well known among theatrical circles. Who will be present? Well, myself and Lily, of course. And uh, Mrs. Paget will be reading Lady Bracknell. Who is this Mrs. Paget? Well, I've never actually made her acquaintance, but by all accounts, an astonishing performer. Spent many years on the stage in America, but nevertheless, they say her talent is still intact. <laughs> <laughs> she was recommended to me by my lady man in danger. Oh, Oscar, I forgot to tell you, she sent a note to say she's suffering a chest cold. Oh, no. oh, but she wouldn't miss the opportunity to read for you. Don't frighten me like that. Just you three, then. Oh, and my housekeeper, Mrs. Tall. How long has she been with you? Just over a year. She is with me constantly. At home, at the theatre, travels with me. I'd be lost without her. And more to the point, you'd never be on time. The woman is a godsend. Have you informed her of your situation? Oh, I wouldn't want to concern her. She's very maternal toward me. Oh, and Miss Drake, my cook. She's beyond reproach, the dearest creature. If I miss a meal, she nearly collapses with concern. She's been with me, oh, six, seven months. Long enough that this no longer fits me from <laughs> <laughs> What is your address, Mrs. Lectry? 21 Port Street. Do as the note says. Say nothing to the three ladies. Proceed just as you would were it any other evening. Now, if you should find yourself in danger... A danger? What danger do you foresee? It would cease to be a danger if we could define it. <laughs> <laughs> in which room will you and your guests be gathered this evening? The sitting room. Are there any windows? Yes. Do this. Put the ransom in an envelope and secret it in your sitting room. Surely you're not suggesting that he pay the blackguard? I am suggesting that she put the ransom in an envelope and secret it in her sitting room. <laughs> and during the course of the evening, I shall make myself known to you. Can you make a guess as to who these people might be? I never guess. It is a shocking habit, destructive to the logical faculty. Mr. Holmes, I don't know how I can ever thank you. I have done nothing yet which deserves your thanks. I know that we can count on you, Holmes. You have a way of seeing through accepted reality to what really exists. And thank God. Otherwise, I would be the author of the picture of Dorian Green. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you again, Mr. Wilde. A pleasure to have made your acquaintance, Mrs. Lang. Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Mrs. Langtree, I can't begin to tell you to express your performance in As You Like It was, well, uh, it's been a great pleasure, Mrs. Langtree. A great, 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 <laughs> Kindly look up the name Langtree in my evening jacket, Doctor. Keats, Kelvin, Klein, Keegard, Langtree. Here we go. Lily Langtree, otherwise known as the Jersey Lily. Born Emily Charlotte Le Breton in 1853, Jersey, Channel Islands, raised a tomboy amongst six brothers. Denied a formal education, she received lessons from a French governess during the day and her brother's tutor during the evenings. From these humble beginnings, she has made a name for herself as a popular actress, captivating raconteur and devastating companion, the royal family. Uh, she has done this with nothing to aid her except her enchanting sense of humour and her exceptional, some would say, startling beauty. Oh, some would say, indeed, all would say. 
I believe you are taken with the lady, Watson. Oh, as is any man who lays eyes upon her. Well, don't you find her countenance beyond compare? I am more captivated with the question of why Mrs. Langtree has not been altogether truthful with us. Well, what do you mean? Uh, to begin with, her charade is a domestic servant. But she said herself that she wasn't a consummate actress. No one is that unconvincing, <laughs> unless they want to be. Well, to what purpose? To demonstrate that she is incapable of even the slightest perception. That when she speaks, she tells the truth, because she hasn't the skill to lie. And then there are the notes. Yeah, surely you believe their authenticity? I do, the two that I saw. But there is a third, the note that she burned. She panicked. Mrs. Langtree makes her living, and a very fine one, by controlling her emotions. And then there is her fear of scandal. Yeah. There's nothing unusual about that. If she were any other woman, no. But Bertie's hedonistic adventures had already been hinted at in the more scarlet journals. This is old news. Perhaps. But aren't letters quite a different matter? People write the most ridiculously honest things in letters. They do. I shall require your assistance, Watson. Of course. You are to station yourself outside of Mrs. Langtree's residence this evening. <coughs> Remain as inconspicuous as possible. Do nothing whatsoever. At some point, the sitting room window will open. You are to position yourself close to that open window. You are to watch for a figure that comes to the open window. Yes. When the individual raises his hand, so, you are to run to the front of the residence and throw into the foyer what I give you to throw. And at the same time, raise a cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. There's nothing very formidable. <coughs> An ordinary plum of smoke rocket, rocket, fitted with a cap at either end for self-lighting. Your task is confined to that. When you raise the cry of fire, it will be taken up by a number of people. When the smoke is cleared, you may join me inside Mrs. Lantry's residence. Have I made myself quite clear? I am to remain neutral. Get near the window, watch for the signal, throw in the object, raise a fire fire, and join you when the smoke has cleared. That is excellent. You may rely on me entirely. <laughs> Fantastic. This evening, Mrs. Langtree is going to show us what the blackmailer is really after. What do you mean? I believe that it is time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. Come, Watson. The game's afoot. Uh, come in. Good day, gentlemen. I'm in search of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am Sherlock Holmes. May I speak with you alone, sir? This is my assistant, Dr. John Watson. You may trust him as entirely as you intend to trust me. Do you know who I am, sir? I believe you are Abdul Karim, attendant and confidant to Her Majesty Queen Victoria. You are correct. I'm here at the request of a certain person regarding the most delicate matter. You may tell the royal family that they have nothing to fear. Sherlock Holmes is already on the case of the missing letters. <laughs> letters? <laughs> what letters? The plot thickens. <laughs> Yes, that's it. You've guessed it. Uh, I thought as much. 
Remember how nervous you were before my heart's desire? And angels with their wings? And the last one, danger? Mrs. Langtree, you're a great actress. Nay, now listen to me. You're a national treasure. That's what the critics call you. You be magnificent. Mark my words. Thank you, Mrs. Tory. I feel better already. I'll ask Mrs. Drake about the tea. Mr. Oscar Wilde to see you, ma'am. Oscar. Sweetheart. Mm. Oh, Oscar. Your heart is racing faster than a derby winner's. I know. I know. What have you been doing since we left Mr. Hope? Well, <clears throat> I've been working on the proof of one of my poems all afternoon. <clears throat> I took out a comma. <laughs> <laughs> Then I put it back again. I am exhausted. <laughs> Cucumber sandwiches. Oscar. Simple pleasures. The last refuge of the complex. <laughs> How can you eat at a time like this? Lily, my love. If I stop eating every time the world proved to be a hostile place, I should cease to exist. <laughs> now, listen to me. Sherlock Holmes is with us now. You couldn't be in better hands if you were locked in the embrace of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Given my part, I'm afraid Jesus Christ would have nothing to do with me. Oh, you're joking. He'd take one look at you and tell dear Papa, sorry old man, there's been a change in plans. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you hide the ransom? Don't names. Is a chauffeur 
ermine jour, ermine gras, ermine iron. Just plain ermine, madam. Yes. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. What wonderful words. Did I write them? <laughs> <laughs> I've never much cared for the name myself. <coughs> Poor thing. Well, shall we get started? Oh, I should probably mention, Mrs. Padgett. Gertrude? Gertrude. To be maybe interrupted this evening. I'm expecting, well, someone may be joining us briefly. But don't let that interfere with your reading. Never fear. If the script didn't stop me, I shall certainly not be distracted by anything other than the great reaper himself. Oh, I hope not. I am not dressed well enough to meet my maker. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm Lady Bracknell, and my niece Gwendolyn, a wonderful role for you, darling. Thank you. My niece Gwendolyn has decided that she will only marry a man who's a, let me see her, whose profession is that of a banker, correct? Oh, you stated it perfectly. It's important that he be a banker? Yes. Well, now, I'll read Jack. <coughs> we'll begin just after my proposal of marriage to Gwendolyn. Um, Mr. Worthy, we'll start there. She's just a gorgon, isn't she? I love her. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most in the course. <laughs> Mama, I must beg you to retire. Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Mm -hmm. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, but you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit, shall inform you of the fact. <laughs> An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. <laughs> oh the interruption you have spoken of has arrived. Someone to see you, ma'am. He won't give his name, but he says you're expecting him. It's all right, Mrs. Tory. Show him in. Who was that? Hold steady, old girl. From the look on your face, may I assure you it is a relative? Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> Pantry, uh, may I present? I told you, no name for names. Uh, Mrs. Lantry, I, I. Yes. I think you know what I'm here. Yes, I do. So, you got something for me then? Yes. You're not exactly what I expected. <laughs> and just what did you expect? Oh, I don't know. Uh, someone more unwholesome looking, I suppose. <laughs> I could be plenty unwholesome if the situation was, believe you me. When you say it like that, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to call anyone's manners into question, but I'm used to being introduced. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Padgett, this is... Gertrude? Gertrude Padgett. And you are... Like I said, nothing for names. Nonsense! <laughs> we were just discussing the importance of names. Without names, we'd just be anonymous animals living in a brick-and-mortar jungle. I'm Gertrude, this is Lily, and Oscar, and Irma. Uh, <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Why, you little gutter rat! Come in here to frighten Mrs. Lantry! Sorry! I didn't care what you came for, but if you so much as help Mrs. Lantry, so help me. Mrs. Story, please! Sorry, ma'am. So you should be. Mrs. Lantry, the package if you please. Come here! <laughs> Sit down! <laughs> <laughs> Sit down immediately! Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, <laughs> or physical weakness in the old. Irma, a cup of tea for the gentleman. 
Nelly is not going to give you anything until you behave like a gentleman and tell us who you are and where you come from. And drink your tea, madam. You are wasting your time if you are planning to do battle with thee, sir. I shall not be moved. Nay. Smythe. John. Here, Richard. No. You rest it, <laughs> Now, now. Who are your parents? That's enough. You want your package, don't you? <laughs> Who are your parents? <laughs> I lost both my parents. Well, they ran away. <laughs> <laughs> to lose one parent is to spite. <laughs> may be regarded as a misfortune. <laughs> <laughs> to lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs>
I will return to the stage portraying Algernon Moncrief in the importance of being forthright. <laughs> Let it be the ten thousand pounds. May I see what the blackmailer is really after? <laughs> it takes a great woman to wear a necklace such as this, and Mrs. Langtree is just such a woman. Now, where have I seen that diamond before, Lily? You are the only man I know who could make such a connection. Or have you made it as well? It was made for me. Her Majesty's attendant, Abdul Karim paid me a visit this afternoon. What did he say? I would rather you tell us the story, Mrs. Lantry. I insist that you tell us the story. A lifetime ago. Go on. I was in love with Bertie. Oh, can we skip that bit? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know I had known Oscar. No one did. Fifteen years ago. But he wasn't the person we'd come to recognize. He wasn't shiftless and irresponsible. A corpulent of a stand to be made spun off. Not then. He was young. And he was. We fell in love. I mean, really, truly, in love. He wanted to divorce Alexandra and marry me. The Prince of Wales giving up the throne for the woman he loves? <laughs> <laughs> Not bloody likely. <laughs> Language, Mr. Wilde. I know that. Now, the night we met for the last time, he brought me the necklace. The stones came from the crown jewels, the best from every piece of the collection. He said, you can't be part of England's history, then at the very least you should be allowed to wear it. <laughs> He had breathtaking counterfeits made up in countless countries and replaced the gems himself. But these counterfeits were not genuine stones. No. <laughs> Why not? God knows he can afford them. <laughs> he liked the idea of his mother wearing coloured glass <laughs> <laughs> and being ignorant of the fact. <laughs> Victoria, you know, was very hard on him. She blamed him for Albert's death. Can you imagine blaming a child like that? He wanted to work and to contribute, but she denied him any official role. He's been humiliated for years, privately and publicly. Jokes on me about him. How is the Queen like the weather? She rains and rains and rains. <laughs> Taking what is his? Mrs. Langtree, 
Are you unable to relinquish this necklace because it represents the love that you once shared with the Prince of Wales? I am keeping the necklace for the simple reason that it belongs to me. And now you know everything, Mr. Holmes. I don't think I do. It has been my experience that when a person unburdens herself, tells everything there is to be told, there is a general relaxation of the facial muscles. At no point have I seen that telltale sign on your singularly symmetrical countenance. <laughs> May I? Holmes. and I think, therefore, perhaps, her regard. It was not possible for me to take that necklace without gaining her consent. Therefore, my mission now is to gain that consent. She must hand me, or the crown, that necklace of her own free will. Well, how on earth will you get her to do that? I mean, you'll hurt her. It belongs to me. I didn't say it was going to be easy. It's going to be a difficult task, and one I am sure I will not relish completing. I will be forced to resort to a piece of trickery, which I find, at this point, it's wholly unappetizing. Well, onward. We must now deal with the awesome piece of the puzzle that we were handed tonight. We now know with whom we're dealing. We do. You have heard me speak of Professor Moriarty. The famous scientific criminal, yes. In calling Moriarty a criminal, you are uttering libel in the eyes of the law. The greatest schemer of all time the organizer of every deviltry, the controlling brain of the underworld, a brain which may have made or marred the destiny of nations. That's the man. He is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. He is the organizer of half that is evil and of nearly all that is undetected in this great city. He is a genius, a philosopher, an abstract thinker. He sits like a spider, motionless in his web, but that web has a thousand radiations, and he knows every quiver of each of them. He does little himself. He only plans. But what plans? The only chick in his armor, and our only hope to defeat him, is his use of emissaries that are not his equal. How on earth do we know he's involved in this? Ah, you weren't here for the introductions. Come. I'll enlighten you as we travel. You confounded idiot! What could I do? Stay there and be burned alive? You are supposed to follow the plan. Collect the ransom and then. I couldn't. There was some old cow there to come ask me questions. <laughs> what old cow? Gertrude something. Gertrude Padgett. That's it. Let me correct myself. You're not a confounded idiot. You're a blithering moron! I had Gertrude Paget's house watched all day. She never left! She was February and confined to her bed! She was there until I saw her. You saw an imposter! You no, know, I've grown a little tired of the way you treat me. Have you now? I'm not sure I want to go through with this. You'll go through with it until the job is done. Why should I? Why? 
First, you accept the job. Second, you need the money. And third, I wouldn't need that toffee if I were you. Why not? Why? Have a good close look at it. I don't see anything. A slight perforation on one end, perhaps. What's all this powder? Now, what do you suppose it is, Mr. Smite? I almost ate this on the way here. But you didn't. You're more predictable than the rising sun. Should you think of leaving my employee before you've been dismissed, bear in mind that you will feel the full force of my displeasure at the most unexpected moment. Where have you been, Kitty? Convincing a body, but he only seen me face. Somewhere before that's where. Did you follow Mrs. Lantry like I instructed this afternoon? Yeah, but... But what? Oh, yes, sir. Must I do everything around here myself? Your only responsibility was to track the movements of one woman. I was carefree about Miss Lantry's headboxes at the time. You were supposed to follow her. Party. 
Get back to it in the same manner as the others. Not before nine o'clock tomorrow night. Yes, sir. Prepare the gas works. We sure have done what I wanted. Bust in your place, old enough to us right and say, give me the necklace, lady, or I'll slit you and smile from ear to ear. Smythe, if the hunter doesn't stalk his prey, it's not really a hunt. Now, if and when extreme measures of persuasion are called for, don't you think an abandoned building on a lonely stretch of road, miles from civilization, would be a less foolhardy place to conduct the proceedings than a lady's residence? <sighs> Flynn and Riker here, I suggest you get to work. Farewell. I'm not sure I like this. Not all of what you can do about it. Oh, what a fair. Not if you want to remain alive. The man almost poisoned me with my topping. What? Stop doing that. I know when you do that. Oh, I don't think there's a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. But there must, might be a nice consolation if we're smart enough to grab it. Only I'll need your help. What, what do you mean? Get some stupid necklace that defence. We ain't got the letters. We ain't even seen them. We don't need them. I know we're air frightened well enough. And the professor was kind enough to read me that one passage. Why do you do that for? He knows what you do for a living. Because he ain't as bright as he thinks he is, is he? We show a bit of a letter like this. We collect the money and over the forgeries and disappear it in the night. What if we fail? But screw your courage to the stick in place, and we'll not fail. He find us. <laughs> not in America. Big country America. I could start over. Lots of bitter. Finally be appreciated for the talent that I am. <laughs> and you could do whatever you like. Maybe buy a farm somewhere. Yeah, you're thinking. Animals, fresh air. All of it yours. Ooh. What we got here? Oh. It's some of Mrs. Langtree's personal stationery. Hmm. Let me see now. How did it go? <laughs> I hope you haven't been terribly inconvenienced 
by this slight detour? Would it matter? No. Your new friend, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, will be arriving shortly. How would you like to save his life? What do you mean? If you tell me the whereabouts of the necklace, I will not only see to it that the photographs and the letters are burned, I will also allow Mr. Holmes to go on living. You underestimate the man. Is that a no? You're quick. <laughs> As we planned. Yes, sir. Ronick and Flynn will be here with home soon. I'll be back in one hour. Yes, sir. Farewell. Put something on me. I'll catch a chill. Listen to you. Other people always tell me how pretty you are. You must get tired of it. What, too good to talk to a bloke like me? That's not it. Well then. What? Do you get tired of people always complimenting you all the time? I'm not complimented all the time. Just occasionally. It's nice, I suppose. I bet it is. Rich blokes, toffs, princes, kings alike. Not always. What, you get it from street peddlers, urchins, and gallerat types as well? Not that exactly. Well, what exactly? I'm not glittering more, I can understand things with, you know, nuance. <laughs> I just mean that you never know who might be attracted to whom. Desire is a strange science. The law of desire, that is. I've known that myself. Take my mum and dad, what she ever seen him? But she didn't. Here I am. Not exactly fair to me. Still, I wasn't born yet, but. Exactly. <laughs> right. What do you know of spare anyway? Man of all servants, jewels and the like. You don't know much about me, do you? Enough. Then you know I was born into a family of six boys. Six? I was the only girl. My mother died giving birth to me and my father held me accountable. Because I was born a girl, it was taken for granted that nothing extraordinary in the way of schooling would be provided for me. <coughs> Meanwhile, my brothers were being educated in <coughs> Latin, mathematics, Greek. Because I happened to be born female, I had to beg, cajole, flatten my way to be taught by my brother's tutors after their lessons were over. When my father discovered the situation, he said, they might as well be trying to teach a monkey to think. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Smythe, you think that was fair? Oh, don't cry. I'm not. Good, well done. You've done bloody well in your life. Look at where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, my wrists! 
see how they take it? I'm so nervous, I'm falling apart. Oh, don't you? Honey, okay. listen to me. Are you listening? I am. Um, is there anyone outside the door? There was, but he stepped away. That's how I was able to get in. Did you see where he went? No. Was it that man's smile or was it someone else? I'm not sure it's dark in there. I'm sorry, ma'am. I guess I'm not a very good heroine, am I? Nonsense. You found me, didn't you? Let me think. <coughs> Can you see anything out the window? No, they're filthy. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I'm not a 
audition, sweetheart. The only way you're getting out of here is by telling the professor where that love twinkie is. I'm afraid she's right, my dear. I'm sorry, Kitty, did I frighten you? You, uh... Yes? Well, it hasn't been an hour. No, it hasn't. What have you got in your hand, Kitty? It's, uh, it's nothing. Let me guess. It's a letter written by Mrs. Langtree to the Prince. Or, more accurately, a letter pretending to be written by Mrs. Langtree to the Prince. Correct? You see, Mrs. Langtree, I plan more than participate in my endeavours, and this often necessitates that I associate with people who intelligence and integrity is somewhat lacking. Kitty, why would I read out one of Mrs. Langtree's letters to a known forger? You see, and this is what I mean. Because I knew that at some moment you would decide to strike out on your own using your greatest talent. Since it was easier to suppress your failure uh, to success your failure, secure your failure, than suppress your instincts, I read for you an actual letter that only been altered in one case, but one I knew Mrs. Langtry could not fail to notice, no matter how fine your duplication of her hand. I never began a letter, my darling Bertie. <laughs> now don't fret, Kitty. I never expect nor require a person to change their nature. And besides, I still have need of your services today. <laughs> if I were half a day younger, I'd crush you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Hope, a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I'm afraid you will be of a different opinion when this day ends, Professor Moriarty. You will forgive me if I don't tremble at that remark. A small wager, perhaps. Such as? The return of Mrs. Langtree's personal papers. If? If, at the end of the day, you found that you've been outdone. Mrs. Langtree's papers are listed. Personally delivered and set ablaze. And how do you happen to be here, Mr. Wilde? He was lurking around Baker Street. Tried to follow Flynn and brought it, so they nabbed him. I have come to rescue my friend, Mrs. Langtree. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How dull. <laughs> and you? You should be ashamed of yourself, Mrs. Tory. <laughs> Name is Kitty Dupre. Oh, not much of an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> It is. Roddy jumped him, this gentleman shot him in the arm, blood all over, Flynn's taken him to the doctors. Roddy managed to wrestle a gun from him. He wasn't called King of the Ring for nothing, you know. I hadn't heard your reviled man, Mr. Holmes. I am not. Mr. Roddy may have something to say about that. This one was tapping without even breaking a sweat. I haven't eaten in over two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a very fragile state. Oh. <laughs> Have they hurt you, Mrs. Langtree? I'm all right. Hello, Irma. Shut <laughs> Nice touch. Her name? Oh, it's a bit obvious. My calling card, no more. What are you saying about me? Your name, or alias, rather. Irma Tory. Rearrange the letters. What do you get? Moriarty! <laughs> I wanted to return the favour somehow, but the only anagram I could come up with for Sherlock Holmes was, Oh, smell her sock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Forgive me, Mrs. Langtree, for not revealing what I had learned earlier of Mrs. Tory, but I didn't want to frighten you, and I felt 
that we may gain an advantage if we left you in the dark for a bit longer. I understand. Some advantage that turned out to be. All right, now down to business. Mr. Holmes, seeing as you like a gun so much, Smythe, hold that one to his head. What? You heard me. Hold it to his head or hold it to your own. Either way, if you do not do as you're told, you will be dead by the end of the day. <laughs> Would you like a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Laintree, where is the necklace? Mrs. Laintree, as a man of science, I do not make idle threats. George, you will be in great danger if you do. Do you wish to die all for a handful of balls? Which belongs to the crown? Uh, it's my intention that the crown shall have them back. You didn't tell us that. Silence. Mrs. Lange, I repeat, where is a necklace? Oh, this suspense is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him. The sitting room in the cabinet. Oh, Lily. I wish you hadn't done that, Mrs. Langtree. The lady had no choice. And now, if you'll excuse me, this is one errand I'll see to myself. What we do with them? Nothing until you hear from me. I'm sorry, Mrs. Langtree, but I simply cannot take you at your word. If you've told me the truth, then you will be released. If you've lied to me, however, may I wish you, and Mr. Holmes and Mr. Wilde, a speedy journey to the other Sunday. Stay on here. <clears throat> Take this. I wouldn't provoke Kitty if I were you. She's quite the marksman. <laughs> Used to be in an act called a uh, do praise daggers. <laughs> you modest spirit. <laughs> you have carnival experience. <laughs> what about him? The playwright. He will give you no trouble. Oh, you think not, do you? I think you would rather avoid any action that would muss up your retirement. <laughs> Farewell. Look at you, don't you have a notice? There's a lady present. Ladies present. <laughs> I am somewhat of an expert on tobacco ash. Perhaps you've heard. Can't say I have. This is their, my latest specimen. Not without merit. Fresh cork. So what? Those iron bars look rusty to me. I'm sure that's none of my concern. No, it might be. To some poor devil who's been caught in a trap. Didn't this used to be the Hamilton Gas Works? How should I know? Mrs. Langtree, you're shivering. Oscar, put something over Mrs. Langtree's shoulders, won't you? Oh, right. I bet you Here you go, old girl. We'll have you warmed up in a jiffy. Thank you. Bet <coughs> you think you're a lot smarter than we are. Oh, just more observant. For instance, when Smythe came to Mrs. Langtree's to collect the ransom, you might recall that I, well, Mrs. Paget, had commented that he had squinted at nearly everyone in that room. So? The only person he didn't squint at was you. That's because Signore knew you. Oh, well done. Mm. Quite you. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that the rancor that you displayed towards Smythe is the kind usually reserved for a blood relations? <laughs> Not strangers. But then I suspected you before I met, met you. Now this I got a real. 
Mrs. Langtree was assaulted in her dressing room at a point in the play when everyone else was on stage and when there was a collective applause from the audience covering her cry for help. The question became, therefore, was the assailant lucky or was he well informed by someone who was intimately involved in the production? Mrs. Langtree informed me that you were her dutiful assistant, both at home and at the theatre. You told Smythe the exact moment to enter her dressing room, as well as the fact that the firearm on her table was merely a prop. Oh, then when you told us your Christian name, well, bloody hell, if you ain't some kind of machine. Good God, man, don't you hear me, babe? You smell like wrong vegetables. Stop moving about. Why? Are you afraid that I'll do something? And what could you do? Shoot me, Paul! I can't see! Oh, Mr. Glass! He's by the window! He's getting away! Here's something to remember me by this round! You'll find a cigar there. We'll see ourselves out. Hey! Come back here! <laughs> and then what happened? So, then I decided that I just had to take matters into my own hands. <laughs> and, uh, just to talk about Sandy's question. Uh, Mrs. McLean never forgets. Well, as I was saying, uh, I left in action when I realised that Lily had been taken against her will. Mr. Holmes had instructed me to stay with you at all times, since he had realized that Mrs. Toy was not your faithful servant. And then you insisted on going out, unencumbered as you would. Mrs. Langtree, I gave you specific instructions to remain at home for your own safety. What could have possibly enticed you? I needed to. I don't know. To think. Uh, I often need time to myself to replenish. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you understand? Well, I do. So, then I had to stay on this tour. I had to make up some ridiculous excuse. I'm writing a play about a fascinating domestic servant. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, she was obviously agitated, and the next thing I knew, uh, she had excused herself to, well, you know, and escaped through a window the size of a porter. Mm -hmm. That's when I went to Baker Street and saw you getting into a cab, and then some ruffian pushed me in as well. Yes, Ben Holmes, how did the blood get on you? <laughs> that was the best part. He shot a man. <laughs> I saw the whole thing. <laughs> oh, just anywhere, Mrs. McLean. Oh, careful there, that's precious cargo. Oh, where are my cucumber sandwiches? Uh, oh dear. Oh, not you again. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Miss Rand? You're not the only one who can impersonate a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Stay right where you are, Mrs. Lane. 
Don't play the hero, sir. In my story, they wind up dead. Fire at will. You will not harm Dr. Watson. We'll see about that. You're coming with me. Let me get up. Where are we going? Well, you've taken me to that necklace. Must be pretty special if it belongs to the crowd. Don't you think we're a little late? You heard me tell Professor Moriarty where it was. Well, I don't think you told him the truth. Are you calling me a liar? I don't know what I called you. A woman with so many, uh, shall we say, gentlemen friends as you? <laughs> shall I not be generous ten for it? <laughs> How dare you speak to Mrs. Langley like that? The people who love only once in their lives are really the shadow people, Lily. What they call uh, their fidelity and loyalty is what I call either the lethargy of custom or their lack of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Faithfulness is to the life, the emotional life, as um, consistency is to the life of the intellect, simply a confession of faith. <laughs> I know I'm so clever that sometimes I can't understand a single word. <laughs> Come on, have you come in with me? You're not going anywhere. Not one that's breath in my body. Well, I'm going to tell you that I'll we'll take care of that. <laughs> Trust me, Watson. Please, me. Stay where you are. You regret that, my friend. Last chance, move aside. I will not. Au revoir, doctor. <laughs> Examine your weapon carefully, Kitty. Is it familiar to you? It should be. What? You took it from Smythe, correct? After he took it from you. And I borrowed it from the Lyceum Theatre. But you shall not it with his gun. I shall no one. Smythe saw Roddick and me struggle. The gun went off. Roddick went down. However, the weapon that Smythe took from me was not the one discharged. No, <laughs> Roddick took that. It is the one that you are now holding. A gun you must have seen a dozen times backstage at the Lyceum Theatre. You see, but you do not observe. <laughs> <laughs> I was right there, and uh, I missed it. Remember back at the gas works, you said I smelled like rotten vegetables? You still do. <laughs> that was very observant of you. Tomato. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many did you pay Roddick off? In advance. Roddick may be a criminal on the lowest order, but some time ago, for the first time in his career, Roddick was going to prison for a crime he did not commit. I read about his case in the press came to his defence. He was acquitted, as he has proven, eager to return the favour. He informed me that the destination of the windowless cab ride was the Hamilton Gas Works, and agreed to take part in a mock scuffle during which we would exchange firearms. In the old times, my this gun to your end. There was no real threat. But <laughs> you couldn't have known that. You were unaware of the rules, Mrs. Langtry. I was. Until Smythe held a gun to his head, and Mr. Holmes said, Don't. You will be in great danger if you do. <laughs> and just for an instant, he looked at the gun, and I observed that it was my prop gun from the place danger. <laughs> but you told him where the necklace was. No, Dr. Watson. Kitty was right. The necklace has been removed. Ah. <laughs> I enjoyed acting with you very much, Mr. Holmes. Professor Moriarty left us alone with Kitty and Smythe because his instincts told him that you were telling the truth. That is a testament to your talent, Mrs. Landry. <laughs> it seems I've given some of my best performances off stage. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit I found performing that scene to be almost um, fun. Oh. Mm. You'll reconsider playing Algernon then? Oh, uh, uh, stop! Good God, where did you come from? The teacup! <laughs> <laughs>
how in the world did you... I suspect that Professor Moriarty's talents are not all in his head. May I suppose that you were double-jointed, sir? <laughs> you may. Why the delay in your entrance? Kitty. She's been in a bit of a financial bind at the present. I told her if she could get the £10,000 on her own, she was welcome to it. You know, ladies first. <laughs> However, she failed. Mrs. Lentry, down to business. You like me, but I'm nothing if not a good <coughs> man. Therefore, this is what I want. Isn't that rather beneath you, Professor? Forgiveness. I refer to what's in your hand. Didn't we hear you say to Smythe, oh, and I quote, it is the unimaginative mind that immediately turns to firearms. And what would you suggest? A jewel. But you're assuming I know something of the art. I never assumed. You gave yourself away. Your quote about the unimaginative mind is from Domenico Angelo, 1717 to 1802, founder of the most famous school of fencing in all of London, and a well-known master of the arts. Unless, of course, you're not quite up to the challenge. I thought just maybe there was a chance that I could keep the necklace 
and the secret. It's difficult to explain. You must think me a hard person if you risk her learning the truth. But that necklace is more than a necklace. It means it meant that the Prince of Wales considered you his queen. Yes. A little more than a youthful indiscretion, I'm afraid. Nonsense. Some indiscretions are simply more youthful than others. <laughs> I think I should like to be popular with you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> All right. Good God, now what? Um, one moment, please. I need to ask you all a favour. I have an appointment with someone just now. Uh, would you mind all briefly retiring to the next room? Oh. Must we? Mm -hmm. I'd like to stay. Uh, I'm sorry, you. Oscar, this is private. I know. That's why I want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you won't need any of uh, No, Watson, I, so there is no threat. After you, Mrs. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar. Oh, coming. <laughs> uh, we'll just be in here. You know, should you? Yes, thank you very much, Oscar. <laughs> you may come in. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Or should I say, good morning? Good morning, Mr. Kareem. I bring greetings from Her Majesty the Queen and the Prince of Wales. Her Majesty has been apprised of the situation? Yes, I see. I have returned to hear the success of your mission and to collect what belongs to the Crown. Her Majesty was pleased to hear that you offered your assistance to the royal family with this unfortunate affair. She knows that you are considered a man of great discretion, as well as keen insight. Further, she wishes to reward your... Uh, you may stop there, Mr. Corinne. Why? I do not have the necklace. Yet, it is a matter of hours or days. It is a matter of my having failed. You could not locate it? It's not that. I had it in my hands at one point. You had it in your... You mean you let it get away from you? That is precisely what I mean. Is there no hope? None, I'm afraid. After your assurance, you gave your word. I know. It's a scandalous. You misled the crown, sir. I did, and I am sorry. The great Sherlock Holmes, we shall see that you are brought to answer for this. And I can tell you won't be anything less than a fatal blow to your reputation. We will make certain of that. In fact, I suggest that you relocate, sir. Somewhere where this gross dereliction will not be frowned upon. The continent, perhaps, or America. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Wait! Don't go! You! You are the woman! I have something for you! Oh, Lily, well done! First, you must forget everything Mr. Holmes just told you. You must report to the Queen that Mr. Holmes has performed these duties admirably and with great discretion for all parties. Will you do that? Yes. I have your word. You have. Here. Take this to Her Majesty. The Crown, thanks. Tell the Crown I said you're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. <laughs> Brilliant choice, Lily. Forgive your enemies, nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> you didn't have to do that. You were right. I was holding on to it for more reasons than I knew. Do you think Professor Moriarty will go to my daughter? Well, I cannot I say. challenge him to another duel if he does. <laughs> I cannot say for certain, Mrs. Langtree. I can only tell you that I have never known Moriarty to continue playing the game once he knows he has been vested. <laughs> Come in. This place is busier than the cloak room at Victoria <laughs> Station. <laughs> I said... <coughs> Step Smith. Watson! Why, yes! Quick, please! Oh! Oh! <coughs> Your letters are photographed with our ash, Mrs. Langstreet. Oh, he made good on his wager. Really? What's that you've got? Do you imagine, Mr. Holmes, that this is the end? You see, Mrs. Langtree, for Moriarty, it was all about the hunt, and in this case, hoped that I would become involved. 
What a heart-pounding evening of fiction. <laughs> Why fiction? Mr. Holmes. Because the good ended happily, and the bad unhappily, and that is what fiction means. <laughs> yes, my goodness, I'm all in. Oh, look at the time. If I don't get my ten hours, I'm useless. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we, Lily? You've been more loyal to me than any man I've ever known. Oh, please don't say that. I think perhaps I had a better in some small way. I have a small confession to make, Mrs. Langtree. No, you don't. You're not the only one who's observed, you know. You could have seen to it that the door was closed. So very pale. Could you help me? In an earlier time, perhaps. Yes? How I should like to believe you. <laughs> Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I swear, the tips with silver, all these fruit tree tops. Swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes in her circle with all. Blessed thy love prove likewise variable. What shall I swear by? Do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt, swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. Adieu. Be happy. Come, Oscar. Let us see if there's a cat. Come. You were very brave tonight, Oscar. Oh, really? You're not just saying that? No. Oh, well, I'm very suspicious of compliments, you know. That's why I attach great importance to your being earnest. <laughs> <laughs> importance. Watson. You did? And she knew that I intended for her to hear it. I see. So you suspected that she wouldn't be able to stand. Exactly. But to hear the Queen's intended speech you like that, I don't... He was only performing as instructed. No. Remember when we were leaving Pont Street? I said I was going to be forced to resort to a piece of trickery which I would find wholly unappetizing. Yes. Mr. Corrid was told to come here and to give me as thorough a dressing down as he could possibly muster, calling into question my loyalty to the crown as well as my reputation. I thought he did very well. I see. And Mrs. Langtry was not aware of this? No. Well, it had to be done, Holmes. Yes. Still? Still. A remarkable woman. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if I had known her as I do now, earlier perhaps, perhaps, of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest of these, it might have been. Home. Enough! That that way madness lies. I suddenly feel adrift tonight, Watson, as if I had lost my moorings. <laughs> it's all right, Holmes. I'll stay with you tonight. Oh, no, it's late. You should be going home. Oh, nonsense. I'm not the least bit tired. Oh. Ah. What? 
I've just had a thought about that serum. Yes. Just thinking, what if um, the one that suppresses all the signs of um, life? Yes, I was thinking, uh, what if the... Um, Good night, sweet prince. Good night, home.